Nadav Kalander is an award-winning photographer with an international reputation. He's photographed actors, politicians, royalty and Olympic athletes, as well as turning his attentions to some ambitious landscape projects. Whatever the subject matter, his work is instantly recognisable by its pervading unease and a propensity towards minimalism. For his most recent exhibition, simply entitled Dust, Kanda travelled to the borders of Kazakhstan and Russia to photograph the radioactive ruins of two towns used for weapons testing during the Cold War. I'm at Flowers Gallery in East London to talk to Kanda about his influences and what draws him to capture the darker side of human experience. Could you tell me about your latest project, Dust, and how it started? Yeah, Dust started with this um, attraction to um, a knowledge that I found out about uh, uh, Google Earth satellite finding two towns in Kazakhstan, really the area just between uh, Kazakhstan and Russia. Interestingly enough, where Dostoevsky was um, exiled, where he was sent away by the Tsar. Um, and I was very attracted by the idea of the secrecy. Um, I've, always, I've always been interested primarily in the human condition. All my landscape is really about the palm print of man and how we interact with our surroundings. And there was something about this wanting to see uh, this part of man, this, this what, keep, you know, what, what, what drives us to keep things secret. That's how it all started. And once I'm attracted to a place, I tend to go and discover and put my head down and become, um, well, really, I suppose, only look for the photogenicness of a place. So I'm not, I'm not intellectually engaged at all at that stage. I'm just trying to feel what it's like to be there, uh, uh, what it is about the place, the atmosphere of a place, and make work that, that looks like my own. See, when you see this sheet of film come back, you, you instantly know. I mean, I knew when I was there what a, you know, what, a, what an alluring image it was. It's, it's, it's so beautiful, and the evening was so beautiful, and the lake, look at it, it's like velvet, and yet you have this, this brokenness, this sort of sculpture of suffering, but shrouded in such beauty. It's almost like Christ on the cross. And it's called She Once Held an Oar. Because the, the guy who I was with, um, who's lived in this town, said that not only her leg was broken, but she held an oar. But she's a, a strangely classical figure. And the light that is highlighting the top of the, the figure, was that pure chance? Did you wait for that to happen? Or? It was pure chance, but once I knew it, I then returned, I think, the next evening again and uh, got more ready. Because the first evening when we arrived, it was almost like that. So I returned again. You, while you were there, um, you had to wear a Geiger counter mm -hmm. because it was a radioactive environment that you were working in. Well, I'd have to say then about the two towns, so there's only one that is um, radioactive. And that was a test site that was set up in 1946, uh, soon after the Hiroshima bomb. Uh, and America and Russia had fallen out. A lot of trust was lost, and, and Russia went off to try and find how they could uh, catch up with the USA with the atomic bomb. And that's the only area. The other area that I also photographed in was a missile um, testing and developing uh, town that wasn't radioactive at all, although the missiles held um, radioactive heads later on. I think this picture really just shows you the modern ruin. Um, the lack of romance in the modern room, yet it is such a uh, window to quite a recent past and quite a dark past that, that human beings took part in. And it's actually black from withstanding the blast that it was built to withstand. Um, black from being burnt from the explosions around it. And all of these face the center where I could never go because my Geiger counter just you know, said how dangerous that was. But at this distance, I was OK. So what is it about the ruins there that was so alluring? I think that um, uh, the ruin is so interesting to me. I think that 
at one level, at an intellectual level, the ruin's always been, well, for, for, for many, many hundreds of years in art history, the ruin has been relevant. It's been painted to lend a gravitas to a landscape. It shows the past. It's a, it's a beautiful way of showing a layering to a landscape. You are, you are living with something from the past, yet you're in the moment, you're in the present. Plus it's something painted, so that might be from the past. So your layering is, is, is layer upon layer. The way that I work, the, 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 the interest in the ruin is much more um, the felt sense of what a ruin is. For me, and I've only discovered this later when thinking about the ruin, they're light, you know, its lights are off, it's being taken over by nature, it's broken. It's a very vulnerable picture that I paint. It's a, it's a, um, it feels like a schoolboy in this playground left alone, you know, kicking stones while the rest of, you know, while the rest of the boys play. It feels alone and it's that that attracts me. And photographing something so vulnerable, but yet quite beautifully, um, seems to be something that I try to do again and again. Things that are uneasy, things that are difficult, but photographed beautifully. With the ruin as well as a feeling of mortality and monumentality and the sublime, that kind of resonates with the romantic tradition. Are there particular artists that you draw inspiration from? Well, with, with past projects, especially the, the Yangtze, most certainly they were. I saw real parallels with, with Caspar Friedrich, obviously, and John Martin as constable. I'm not so sure that I, that I am with this. I'm not drawn to the, to the ruin if it's, if it's the romantic ruin. I think that beauty on beauty equals boredom for me. So um, it's more the uneasiness of the Cold War and what these are really monuments to that, that, um, that give the sort of mustard onto the chocolate cake. There's no point. I would never go to Wales and photograph a, you know, some fantastic abbey on a hillside because I haven't got the opposite and I need the opposite. I really equate it to the truth of life, that there's no beauty without imperfection or there's no birth without death. And it's the yin and yang that I think the human condition gets attracted to. I think we, we find that attractive, that things are quite difficult. But had I just photographed them to be difficult, my opinion would have been very strongly upon them and they would feel quite documentary, which I never want. You know, I don't see myself as a documentarian. I didn't go to Russia to point a finger. I didn't go to expose anything. Um, I went to, to put a mirror in front of me on mankind. You know, America, Richard Mizrach, for instance, photographed the missile sites of, of Nevada. This has happened there. It's happened in Germany. It's happened in, in South Africa, Israel, I'm sure. So it's not particularly um, Russian this project. It happens to be there, it's located there, but it's a real look at our shadow and the dark side and human condition. So how much of you is in the image? How much of you is reflected in what, you, what you're drawn to? I think that's a, it's a really great question, an interesting question. I think hugely I'm in them. When I talk about vulnerability, it's very attractive to me. Um, but I don't really know why, and I'm not sure I want to know why. But yes, I seem to do the same thing again and again and find different ways to do it. And if you know my portraiture, it's also very much in my portraiture. It's the, it's the part of people I find quite beautiful. There's a melancholy, there's something about melancholy that I find really attractive. And with your portraiture, how much of uh, a portrait is influenced by the sitter? I mean, do they have the input or do you just work intuitively based on meeting them? Um, both, but you can intuitively involve the sitter too and sometimes not. I think when I work with people that really understand atmosphere, like a musician or, a, or an actor, um, it can be fantastic to collaborate a bit and work up an image to become a real experience for a viewer, because that's really what it's always about. Uh, in all art, it's about that triangle of, of artist, subject, whether it's landscape or portrait, and the viewer. And the viewer has to get an experience, and it's, it's everything, everything in my past, all my baggage, all, everything that, that, that comes before me, comes into the room with me, or comes into the landscape with me. 
So of course it's vested in the work. And everything that the viewer, everything that comes behind the viewer comes into the room when they look at the work. And it's that dance almost that's really interesting. And What is it about a particular scene that would make you stop in your tracks and take your camera out? Um, I don't know if I can intellectualise it and put it into words other than... Um, I mean, atmosphere is a big word for me. It's about as close as I can get to it, because you can't see atmosphere, you can't touch it. But anybody understands what, what it means. There can be atmosphere in a picture. Um, I think that my work is described well in being really quiet um, uh, and expansive. And I think when I can make work like that, that also contains that that dis-ease and beauty at one time, uh, that's when I seem to get excited and the camera goes up. Um, I often get out the car and walk around and it's not quite right and get in and drive on and multiple things can happen that make you want to get out again and suddenly more things happen and it works. But it's very intuitive. It's not only um, what's in front of you that makes you want to photograph it, but also what you've recently made in the series and how that piece fits in, or what you're about to photograph fits in, or how you might decide to colour it slightly differently, or the whole thing, the whole thing becomes a picture. I'm much more interested in the, in the series of work than the single picture, and the whole series of work is what paints the, the picture, really. That's going to be my next question. How you decide which images to include in an exhibition like Dust? I mean, you must have thousands of pictures. Uh, you know, I didn't have thousands. I, go, I, tend to, I tend to travel to an area only for about 10 days. Um, even that's a lot. Yangtze may be a bit longer, two and a half weeks because of all the travel. But somewhere like here, you would go for six days, eight days, because I feel that I have a real sensitivity to it for a very short time. Um, it's a big camera, I go under a dark cloth. I might, I might make um, 150 pictures maybe in that time. Some of them are multiples of the same picture. So when I come to, when I come to edit, it's, uh, there are a lot of pictures, but I don't know, it's somehow it's very quick. You know, that first look that you have at the film or at the digital screen, however you are editing, that first look is the most important. When something really attracts you and jumps out, that's the time to mark it. And then I go over it again and over it again, and then I might work on it, on its color, and see how it fits in, and slowly the edit gets down and down, um, gets more concise and more concise. It's really important to me that I don't make compendiums book, you know, that I don't make books of 300 pictures, and. I really want to edit it down so that what I'm saying is as, is as uh, clear and concise as possible. Do you have plans for similar projects in the future to the Yangtze River and Dust? Because they seem quite similar in tone, issues surrounding humanity. Mm. Is that something that you're going to explore further in the future? Well, I think that everything I do is about human condition. I think it's all about human beings. My landscapes aren't about nature. The Yangtze wasn't about the river. It's always about people. Um, between the Yangtze and this project, there was one called Bodies, which I made in my studio, which also is all about humans and distancing humans. So, yes, I will continue. I don't have anything in the pipeline right now. I, um, I look forward to thinking more about that when this is a bit further down the line. But I work quite slowly. Everything seems to have two or three years between it. Why is that? Um, I think because I, want, I don't want my work to have this documentary feeling to it. Um, so I take, you know, I, I, I go to a place and I spend those six days or ten days, I come back, I probably don't return for six months. And during that six months I look at the work, I, uh, people come and talk to me and we discuss it and slowly I learn. I, the work almost teaches me, I start to discover what it is about it that's attracting me all the layers and nuances of it. And then when I return, I'm, I'm even more concise. And each time I return, and with Yangtze it was five times, with this project only twice. Um, but each time you return, you, 
you become more prolific and and um, tighter, just more more targeted. This is the last picture I took in the polygon, which is a 20 mile crater. It's an unmarked area, but it's the it's where 700, 800 bombs were blown up in the in in, in the discovery of making the atom bomb and the trigger to trigger it, to split the atom. Um, and it's such a windswept, beautiful subject. Uh, and the only reminder to its dangers were my Geiger counter clicking on my belt. So it was always bringing me back to the reality that, what I, you know, that I was standing in quite a dangerous place and somewhere with a very dark past. And that's why that picture has a lot of meaning for me and very difficult to print. Very hard picture to get the, to keep dark and yet have glowing. <laughs>